We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is David Jensen. He's a mining executive and metals analyst. How are you today, David? I'm well, Tom. Thanks for having me on your show for the first time. Absolutely excellent to finally be able to hook up with you and have a chat. So going through your Twitter and stuff for today's interview, you were saying that metal shortage ends paper pricing. So how tight is the silver market right now? And do you have a sense for how many contracts will be standing for delivery instead of rolling forward or settling for cash this month? Okay. Well, the two separate questions there, because for the physical market, I'm typically watching London through some connections and at the bullion banks and in particular following the lease rates in London. Now, the LBMA says that they are very liquid. They said how great it was. They're trading a billion ounces a day of these spot contracts and that shows market liquidity. But the problem is with the LBMA contract, the spot contracts are primarily unallocated contracts. Mm -hmm. So there's no dedicated bar for each contract of trading. So I tend to ignore the price signals that we're seeing, and I just focus on bar availability. And the best signal I know for that is the actual lease rate in London. Mm -hmm. And when there's a lot of metal in the vaults that the vault holders like to lease it out so that they don't have to hold it and insure it. And that typically drives a negative lease rate, meaning that you have to return less metal than you actually borrow Mm -hmm. because you take it off their hands for a period. But we've now seen in the last few weeks here, we've seen the silver lease rate spike to a positive and start to move up quite strongly. Yeah. And that's a very dramatic chart. I was able to see that and we can post that on the video here as well. Yeah. Now it can go much higher when there's a panic. For me, it's that we've crossed kind of the Rubicon, if you want to put it that way, or, Mm -hmm. you know, the tripwire into metal shortage in London, which is the primary physical market. And it's the one that's being advertised as being so flush with metal. So the signal's they don't match the reality that we know that there's a thousand ounce bar shortage in the market. Mm-hmm. Now to the second part of your question there, in terms of the amount of metal at, at the comics this month, yesterday being February 24th was the final trading day for the March futures contract. And the day ended with still about 85 million ounces of silver contracts extant. So what that does is create claims now on the vault stock in New York of the primary, you know, half a dozen or eight vaults that are there for the COMEX, the CME COMEX. Mm-hmm. So we know that those vaults hold about 135 million ounces of registered silver ounces. So the registered category is the category that's available for delivery. So we'll have to follow now the deliveries each day and watch how that impacts the spreadsheet that's put out by the COMEX in terms of their vault holdings. Now, to complicate matters, we know that the COMEX rulebook allows forced cash settlement Mm -hmm. at the option of the directors if they deem it's in the interest of the exchange. So, you know, there will be some things going on there in the market that, you know, we won't fully have visibility of. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, they can force cash shortage, but at the same time, there is a legitimate physical bar shortage that can't be met with cash. So we'll have to see how that balances out. So are we seeing this shortage as well? Could we chalk some of the data of the backwardation? So the cost of rolling a contract forward, Mm -hmm. as Ed Steer recently pointed out, this could be another kind of symptom of that as well, correct? Well, yeah, backwardation usually reflects the fact that your spot market price is higher than your futures market. Mm -hmm. And the problem is there is that if you can't extinguish that backwardation relatively quickly, it's an indicator that there's a real problem and and actually you're losing confidence in the market because bar holders, if you do have bars that are in the market and available to market, they can get guaranteed return by simply selling spot, buying future, and then getting delivery in the future of the bar to get, Mm -hmm. you know, not exact bar, but to get bars back to replace that, which you have sold. So if you can't sell spot and buy futures and extinguish the backwardation, it's a problem. It's an indication of loss of trust to some extent and actually losing confidence in, in fiat dollars ultimately, because you know, the unwillingness to part with the metal that, that is held in the vaults to, to get the fiat dollar profit. Mm-hmm. So is there any way to tell what inventory levels are in London and New York? And obviously you were saying the spiking lease rates yeah. are a reflection of this. So it, can yeah. we actually tell what those inventory levels are? 
Well, you know, the best source I know for that information is Ronan Manley there at Bullion Star. And the work he's done is showing in round numbers is about a billion ounces these days in the LBMA in London. Mm -hmm. And that approximately 85% or 850 million ounces are, are putatively held by the ETFs, exchange traded funds. So like SLV and some of the others. So that would only leave in the order of about 150 million ounces. Now, I know you'll probably lead into this later, but the statement there of Jeff Curry from Goldman that the mm -hmm. ETFs are actually selling or shorting into the market. He used the word selling, mm -hmm. but shorting into the market metal, which is held for the ETF shareholders is concerning, but it could create a secondary artificial supply of metal into the market, ultimately of these rehypothecated bars that they're supposed to be holding. So mm -hmm. it's unclear in the net then. Can you walk us through why his words were so profound in that interview? Yeah, disturbing, right? Because mm -hmm. it was quite, uh, I don't know the right word, maybe a little bit cocky about it, but he was saying people think that these ETFs are actually creating shortages. And these people don't understand and don't realize that the ETFs simply turn around, they secure the metal for shareholders, and then turn around and sell it into the market, short it into the market. So what's disturbing about that is that the ETFs are supposed to be holding the bars uh, segregated bars and vaults protected for their shareholders who are the beneficial owners of those bars. And in essence, what he's alleging is that these ETFs are actually creating a second claim on the bars because you have the owners who have claim on the bars. And if they're hedging them into the market or selling them, as he said, into the market, you're basically creating two claims on one bar, which is the old trick again, right? And that goes back to Blythe Masters of JP Morgan back in 2012, where she was interviewed on CNBC and asked directly if JP Morgan was rigging or affecting the silver price. And she said, no, we don't. We simply hedge for our clients. And we know that JP Morgan for numerous ETFs are the custodial vault holders of the metal. And if JP Morgan is indeed shorting this stuff into the market, and what she calls a balanced book being the metal that they hold versus the short that they're set that they put on the book for their clients. What they're really doing is that they are shorting something into the market, which they would know is owned by others, right? They are the custodians and they operate at the direction of the trustees of the ETFs. In the case of SLV, the, the trustee is Bank of New York Mellon. And the custodian agreement says that they will do what they're being instructed to do by Bank of New York Mellon. But you know, to say that we're simply doing what our clients tell us to do, they would have knowledge that this metal is not owned by the ETFs. And that's concerning to hear. So mm -hmm. it's exactly what everybody was concerned about, which is basically multiple claims for bars or non-extant bars in the vault and shorted into the market. So, And of course, we'll put both of the links to those interviews in the show notes as well. Yep. But you recently pointed out that there has been a 354% increase in physical silver deliveries out of China. So mm -hmm. could this be to help cover the silver that Jeff has pointed out could be the ETFs shorting into the market? Yeah, I don't know. We don't know those details, but we do know there in Shanghai that there's the futures market is 335 million ounces of silver delivery. So more research needs to be done into that. But it's uh, it was a flag that I saw raised yesterday. Mm -hmm. But we do know that you know, if there's only 150 million of total ounces available in London, we know there's about 135 million ounces in the registered category in New York, but 85 million of those could putatively have been claimed now through the March contract for delivery. Mm -hmm. We know that the hundreds of millions of ounces that the ETFs would need to secure in, in order to cover the shorts wouldn't be available. So. Mm -hmm. So we've seen in the not too distant past, some counterfeit bars come from China. So do you yeah. see this as a risk of sourcing silver from China at this time, David? Well, I mean, you'd have to do a proper audit and assay mm -hmm. process to ensure the security of you know what is coming. So I personally wouldn't trust it. But you know, if you, if you have a proper assay protocol in place, you could do your statistical sampling in order to confirm the, the validity of what you're receiving. So so as we've seen, you know, we were talking about the SLV and the recent prospectus changes in some of these ETFs have caused some suspicion in the market as well. So can yeah. you walk us through what some of these changes were? Well, the primary one for me was their notification that in certain market conditions that they may not be able to source enough silver for the ETF. Mm -hmm. Now, what they're running up against is the, you know, the analysis there from Bullion Star is that 85% of the silver in London is supposed to be held by the ETFs. 
And if the ETFs continue to acquire 100, like, I mean, they acquired 105 million ounces in just a few days at the beginning of February. And if that kind of acquisition of metal in the market continues, even if they're not acquiring that metal, it at least it creates the appearance that they are acquiring that level of metal, mm-hmm. which would cause people to say, well, how can you possibly be acquiring this much in the market? You know, if we know that there's only 150 million total ounces available in London to the market overall, how can you be acquiring 100 or 150 million additional ounces in this kind of a market? So whether or not they're doing what Goldman's Curry says they're doing, at the very least, it creates a apparent concern if they continue to be acquiring those levels of ounces in just a few days span. Mm -hmm. So obviously this raises some questions for you about the allocation of this metal, right? Yeah. I mean, I can only take Curry at his word. I mean, he's a market and an industry insider Mm -hmm. right there in New York. And if he says that's what they're doing, then we have to, you know, I would believe him and listen to him and at least look into it. And the fact that it aligns with the very concerns that investors have been raising for years now and people such as GATA, I've been saying that there's something that's malodorous about some of these ETFs. It's concerning. And the fact that it was so casual about it and was seemed almost amused by it is concerning as well. So you have an article talking about the regulatory filings of SLV and that they actually have two different accounts, unallocated and allocated. So can you walk us through what these mean too? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the prospectus of the iShares uh, Silver Trust ETF, which is run by BlackRock. I mean, the, the ETF says in it that the agreement with the custodian being JP Morgan Chase is such that it contemplates that they would not hold more than, you know, a, a one 1,000 ounce bar, or I think they say up to 1,100 ounces of silver in any one day in an unallocated form. But the, the fact that it just contemplates that, but it's not strict contractual language. So you dig a little bit further and then you look at the custodian agreement between JP Morgan Chase and the trustee, which is Bank of New York Mellon, it only says that they'll take reasonable steps to secure allocated metals, which means that, you know, if the market becomes twice tight, they can say, well, it was unreasonable to acquire mm-hmm. it. But the other thing that was unusual in there was that it said that there is specifically that JP Morgan maintains an allocated account and an unallocated account at the direction of Bank of New York Mellon for the ETF. And it says that the allocated account is maintained in respect of which uh, of silver, which you ask us to hold for you on an unallocated basis. Now, unallocated basis means, you know, an unbacked promissory note as opposed mm-hmm. to an actual bar itself. So, you know, digging into these documents, we see there's provisions in there for holding unallocated metal. And SLV has never reported these two accounts. Like here are our unallocated holdings. And here are our allocated holdings on a you know quarterly basis so that the investors can see what they hold. So certainly again, it raises a flag and is of concern that you know exactly what shareholders were concerned about, investors were concerned about that they may be holding nothing and that these are really investments in digital promissory notes, which can be created in an infinite amount, would be concerning to any investor, I think, who are looking for real assets to protect their investments. Mm-hmm. So, David, do you think that there's a possibility of any of these funds closing to new money if they can't source the physical silver to back them? Yeah, I do. I think that could very well happen. And in fact, SLV added that note that they may be unable to create additional units for their open-ended funds. So, yeah, I think it's very, very possible it could happen, Mm -hmm. especially in this market where we're hearing about shortage of 1,000-ounce bars and, and seeing the lease rates starting to surge in London to back up that actual bar shortage, yeah. So what do you think the consequences for those funds would be if that actually happened and they did close? In terms of the share price or what we'd see in the market, I mean, it would be basically disruptive to them in terms of uh, being incapable of issuing additional shares and that they wouldn't be able to track the price of silver, which they say is the goal of the fund, right? Mm -hmm. So they're supposed to track and benefit and accrete wealth for the shareholders. So they would be highly limited in terms of liquidity of the shares in the market. You'd see an illiquidity of the shares in the market. Mm-hmm. I mean, that would be one of the problems. That's what, one of the reasons that, you know, personally, I just, I look at a, an ETF like PSLV, which is the Sprott ETF, and the fact that they hold their silver in Canadian vaults. And that I talked to their investor relations representative and he's saying that they're, you know, they're moving thousand ounce bars directly into their vault as they report it on a daily basis. So that's a lot more encouraging. And the fact that also that you can take delivery as an average investor 
and not just selectively like you can in the ETF such as SLV, which will only allow authorized participants who are the bullion banks to claim delivery. So I see that as, you know, personally, I just, I see that as a lot more comforting in terms of being able to own silver digitally in, a, in an account, which is actually backed by the real thing. And I, I think I view that as more secure. So as a couple of our recent guests on the show, like Ted Butler and Ed Steer have pointed out, there are eight big banks that hold a massive short position in the futures market. So how do you see these positions possibly being closed? Is there any way for them to be able to close their positions without much damage to the banks or, you know, without a major price dip? Well, I mean, this feeds directly back into Jeff Curry there of Goldman and uh, Blythe Masters of JP Morgan at the time, their, their statements is... The whole issue is that they're they're holding half a year's silver production on the books of the bullion banks that are short the silver market. And everybody's like, well, where are these 500 million ounces coming from? If these are the short positions that you hold, now the banks don't hold them themselves in all likelihood. They hold them for clients, as Master said. But the problem is if these short positions that they hold are backed by rehypothecated metal or metal on which there are multiple claims, you've got a severe problem in the market. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm wondering is if the CFTC starts to poke around a little bit and these bullion banks and ETFs start to try to cover, you know, short positions for which there's multiple claims, you could have a a illiquidity event in the metals market and disruption actually in terms of availability of the metal, because the numbers are so large, right? You're talking 500 million ounces in a market in which there's a fraction of that available to market. Mm -hmm. So what are the downstream consequences of that, David, if that happens? Are are these banks going to have to, you know, buy in and drive up this short squeeze as some people are trying to theorize that could happen? Well, in theory, you should. Now, the problem is we've got Gary Gensler in there who comes from Goldman and, and from the investment world of these you know, very bullion banks themselves who are playing the games in the market. So it's not like, you know, they call him the sheriff, but I mean, he's no sheriff. He's one of the inside club members. So in theory, there should be a forced short covering to resolve the issue. But in reality, when you know you've got these insiders here who basically take care of each other, mm-hmm. I don't really see that happening, that being likely. There's a difference between the law and the law as it is applied, right? Right. Because these, you know, rule changes always seem to just benefit, let's say, the big banks when they, you know, need it to happen. Right. Yeah. It's, it's abusive behavior, which is legitimized by the fact that the rules are changed and that the accommodations are made to allow them to continue to do it or to not suffer the consequences of the illegal actions. So highly concerning. Mm-hmm. So in your opinion, David, is there any way that this, you know, resolves in a dramatic fashion? That's a very good question. I mean, I just from a legal standpoint and, uh, you know, you look at the directors of these ETFs as fiduciaries, I would think that they would start to become nervous because there's no certainty in terms of how it's ever resolved. And that the fact is you've still got civil suits coming at you if your shareholders find out, even if you're not going to get the CFTC or criminal sanctions, shareholders can come after these directors on a personal level if they're acting in a way that is deemed to be illegal. Mm -hmm. So I would think that the directors of the ETFs, if they're doing what Curry says they're doing, they've got to be super nervous at this moment now and looking for ways to avoid the consequences of their actions. And the best way to avoid it is to cover your short position and make the problem go away and pretend you never did it. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens. But, you know, at the same time, there's the whole, you know, what's called the Wall Street bet silver movement. But I, I really view that as the deplorables in the States. I mean, the demand is coming out of the States. The unbelievable physical demand from the retail bar investors is coming out of the States right now. And I really look at it, people that are just fed up with the corruption. And my personal view is that the election, when you look at the numbers are corrupt. When you look at state after state of the key states, you look at the process that went into the counting there. And I think that people are starting to vote with their feet and they're just leaving the system. Mm -hmm. And what a super way to do it in terms of securing real assets and uh, just saying, you know what, you guys can have your digital stuff. We're tired of being hosed and we want a little bit of personal independence. So I'm seeing that happening there in the States and and you're seeing the premiums, uh, the premia, for instance, if you're looking at a hundred ounce bar that used to be running at about three to 4% above the spot price in terms of the price you have to pay. Mm -hmm. And now for more than a month, the premium has been running 16 to 20%. So that's the largest nomination bar that retail investor typically buys. I mean, they can buy a thousand ounce bar too, 
And even those were hearing that there's shortage in the market, but there's been a, just a welter of demand for physical products in terms of bar and coin. And the premia that we're seeing, like 50, 60% on a, a Silver Eagle, in some cases, 30% in the vast majority above spot and, you know, up to 20, 20 plus percent on a hundred ounce bar even speaks of an actual shortage of metal in the market. So it, there's something very real going on here. And Jeffrey Christian of CPM and all these analysts saying that there's no way that investors can create a short squeeze. It's not true, the, especially if we have short covering at the same time by these ETFs and bullion banks who have been in there in the market and doing the things that they do. Mm-hmm. So David, just to kind of wrap all this up, what do you think the downstream consequences are if you know all of these contracts stand for delivery and they're not able to actually be delivered on? Are they just going to you know, settle for cash, as you said? Yeah, I mean, they can be forced to settle for cash, but the question is the terms. They could certainly put in place a non-disclosure agreement and say, well, we'll give you 50% premium to you know what you had to pay here in terms of taking cash settlement versus taking the bar. We don't know what the terms that they offer. But the issue is, is that there is a legitimate bar shortage in the market right now for the industrial size thousand ounce bars. Mm -hmm. And the refiners need them and the mints need them that are striking these bars and coins. And, you know, even silver and gold are Giffen goods, which is a term used to describe something for which the demand increases with a higher price. Mm -hmm. And that's initially, but ultimately nothing solves high prices better than high prices. And the price has to be let to run and it has to be able to reset to the level where the market need is met and that you reach an equilibrium between buyers and sellers. And that's the market economy. But what we've seen now, ever since the creation of, of central banking is intervention by central planners in a market economy, creation of a cycle of bubbles and crashes and stripping of assets of, of citizens. And then ultimately the central banks act as gambling insurance for the banks because the banks and the financial industry are, are let loose when they create the liquidity. And when the consequences uh, vest, like they did in 2008, 2009, they are bailed out by the central banks. And essentially that the central banks act as liquidity providers to blow bubbles, and they act as gambling insurance for the big banks who claim they're too big to fail. Mm -hmm. So is there anything else that we didn't touch on there, David, that you'd like to highlight about the silver market right now? No, I think that, you know, we've seen rhodium go from, you know, it's over 26,000 bucks an ounce today. Mm -hmm. It was 600 bucks just a couple of years ago. It jumped $1,400 in a day Mm -hmm. between yesterday and today. That's a metal that's not traded with a digital futures contract. It's just straight supply and demand Mm -hmm. uh, on a metal brokerage basis. So that gives you an example. Now, palladium did the same thing back in 2016 to, you know, 2018, 2019. It rose five to six fold Mm -hmm. as the shortage hit it prevents you from setting the price with digital paper because you sell into the market. People get a hold of your paper. They say, we don't want profit. We don't want trading profit. We don't want to hold your paper. We actually need a bar and we want a bar. Mm-hmm. So that's how physical shortage kills the digital price setting. And I think, you know, it's, it's uh, come to the palladium market. It looks like platinum starting to take off silver and ultimately gold will go as well as the you know investors move into these valuable real assets to protect themselves from the the cycle of currency debasement by the central banks. And they look like they're ready to leg up and do it at even a a greater level now with, you know, the recent statements by Powell. And, you know, we've seen copper and oil and other assets jump by more than 2% in a day. Lumber is going crazy. And at the same time, Powell says it'll take several years to reach a 2% inflation level. I mean, they're doing this stuff and (laughs) the price of these assets are moving that much in one day, right? And come on, who are you kidding? So, but that's not how we measure inflation, David. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not the narrative and it's not the, yeah. you, know, you know, Powell, every time he says inflation should do the air quotes thing, right? And say <laughs> inflation with his fingers in the air, just so mm-hmm. that people are aware that it's not really indeed a measure of consumer goods price inflation mm-hmm. at all. Yeah. And there's actually an interesting uh, correlation that I believe most of the all-time highs or previous all-time highs in rhodium were also followed by a major economic crash. So Mm -hmm. there's kind of an interesting correlation there. And you actually beat me to the question about that, you know, the metals market of rhodium that doesn't have, you know, futures paper contracts associated with it. And it's still one of those markets where, you know, free market pricing actually works, right? 
Right. And so it's just going to continue to rise until the production meets demand. And there's a lot of incentive now for rhodium miners to actually mine the stuff. It usually comes out of the platinum and palladium mines in South Africa. So, you know, there's been some disruption there because of COVID, but there's also investment demand and other demands that are hitting that market as they're hitting. But historically, Tom, we've seen platinum run first and then silver run and then gold run when these inflationary waves hit. And that is in the order of the liquid metal in inventory available to market. But I think that I'm looking at the trading. There's so many signals that there are growing and very real silver shortages globally. And it's intensifying. And to see the price sitting flat at 28 and not responding to these shortages speaks to me of a problem with the digital trading market. And if the price discovery is not allowed to occur properly, then what happens is metal just disappears from circulation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what we're facing here is that we're, we're going to see this stuff gobbled up quite quickly. And then you essentially end up with a price reset in a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. So David, on your Twitter profile, you highlight the fact that you warned the Bank of Canada about the financial crash of 2008 nearly a year before it happened. So what were the conditions then that you saw as warning signs that needed to be brought to their attention? Well, it was, I mean, that was uh, David Dodge, who was a lecturer while I was doing my MBA at UBC, and then he became the governor of the Bank of Canada thereafter. And my concerns at the time were identical to what they are now in terms of the cycle of a debt-fueled economy. And the suppression of precious metals have historically acted as an inflation and warning indicator. And they certainly did in the 70s when the loose monetary policy was affected by the Fed for more than a decade. And you saw gold go from, you know, 42 bucks an ounce in 1971 to nine years later, it was 850 bucks an ounce. And the Fed, you know, silver had this, a similar level of run from, you know, the fours to 50 bucks an ounce. And so what happened was that the Fed bulker, and this is where there's so much disinformation about the Hunt brothers' role in the market. The Hunt brothers were were participants, but they weren't the fuel that was driving the silver market. What was driving the silver market price was the inflationary monetary policy of the Fed. And the Fed was boxed into a corner where they, uh, Volcker, and you can read the discussions that went on between Paul Volcker and John Exter. But, you know, Volcker was wondering how high he had to raise the interest rates before they could draw investors back into bonds again, and, and parenthetically, out of gold and out of silver, out of timberland. Timberland was gro- well, the price of timberland was increasing by twenty two percent compounded in the nineteen seventies on an annual basis. So, I mean, essentially, what had to happen there was that they had to raise interest rates high enough, and and that would tighten monetary policy enough that people weren't flooding into gold and silver assets. Now, what happened then was that in 1987, the LBMA was created over in the UK, and that became the vehicle for trading these unallocated gold contracts and silver contracts. And that effort was driven by Evelyn Rothschild, who was of the Rothschild trading empire. They essentially ran the London gold market there for 40, 50 years. And then we've lived ever since with kind of a digital pricing or digital intervention in a physical market. And so my concerns to get back to your question are exactly as they were in 2008, is that you have digital fuel, which is the monetary policy of the central banks, spurring the markets on. There's nothing uh, organic in terms of the price growth of these assets. And what they're doing is driving price bubbles driven by monetary policy. And we know that when you run loose monetary policy like this, that you get a distortion of the economy and you build in inefficiencies and and misallocation of capital. And in the end, the economy becomes so addicted to additional liquidity uh, and stimulus that it doesn't function properly. And I think that's where we're at now is that this has continued on for decades and decades while the precious metals markets have been shut down and that we're now at the point where we've got a completely dysfunctional economy, much of it levered by um, uh, speculation in the markets and that we have now a reckoning that's coming at us as a consequence of these decades of debt-fueled growth and, and monetary-based growth. Absolutely. So what are the you know major parallels to today's environment and by how many factors worse are these indicators right now? Sure. I mean, if you look at just debt versus GDP, I mean, it's many times worse now. I mean, in Canada, we're over 500% total debt. Now that's federal provincial, corporate, consumer, the whole ball of wax. When we look at the debt level, we're well over $12 trillion now in total debt. It's not the federal debt you need to watch. It's the total debt. Mm -hmm. And so what we have now is that the historic norm in the 20th century 
for many, many decades was of the order of 150% of GDP. So in Canada last year, we saw debt growth, which was approximately equal to GDP. And so when you've got that level of growth of debt versus the GDP of your country, you are in serious, serious trouble and people have no clue about it. We've got a federal government which talks nothing about it. And the average person doesn't have the time nor the inclination, unfortunately, to dig into the StatsCan database and, and look at these numbers. But the numbers are, are just mind blowing in terms of the level of debt accumulation and the inability of the economy to respond with any kind of growth, even with the massive increase in the debt. So, you know, I, I'm seeing Tom here that we've basically got a dysfunctional economy and no real plan to solve it. All we hear about digital money, which is Dave Collum mentioned there on Twitter that it's the same as locking the doors on the nightclub before the fire starts. On cash, right? Yeah, the, going to a digital monetary system where there's no cash to take out of the system mm -hmm. and that you're basically locked into the digital banking system is in essence the same as locking the doors to nightclub before the fire starts. And it's very, very unfortunate. And that's not a solution, by the way, either. It's just another way for the central planners after decades of inappropriate policy and abusive policy, applying one more level of control on the citizens of what were formerly free countries. Mm -hmm. And you recently highlighted that the Fed has discontinued the reporting of M2 money stock. So right. could this be a symptom of trying to control optics before it raises more attention? Well, they've done it before. I don't know exactly why they've done this and they've created a new index for it. But we know that before 2008, they discontinued M3 as well, which has grown grossly. So I, I would imagine that we're going to see trillions and trillions of dollars added into the system. But again, it's the same thing as, you know, you want to compare it to a physician who's, you know, acting and performing quackery on his patients that you're just applying more and more of the drug, which caused you the problem in the first place. And so creating more debt and more money to solve a problem caused by too much debt and too much liquidity in the system is not a solution. And, you know, we need adult intervention at some point, and I don't see where it's coming from. Absolutely. It's going to be maybe a forced resolution to this problem, right? Yeah. After decades of abuse. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, David. Well, do you have anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap up here? No, I just encourage people to keep an eye on the symptoms in the markets. I don't look at the price discovery as anything particularly valid because of how disconnected it is from supply and demand. Mm -hmm. But to watch the signals in terms of premia on retail products, I think most valuable is to follow the lease rates, and I'll try to provide those as I can, mm -hmm. um, the lease rates in the London gold, silver, platinum, and palladium markets, but to get a whiff of the true supply and demand that's going on out there. You know, when you've got Powell saying that we're not going to reach 2% two and two percent inflation in, for several years, and we've got the type of price moves in commodities that we're seeing now, it's more than a little bit disconcerting. Excellent. Of course, you're available at... Real David Jensen, J E N S E N, yep. on Twitter. And yep. we'll also link to your LinkedIn profile. Excellent. Thanks for your time, Tom. Thank you, David. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.